Happy New Year. It's the Jewish New Year. And I'm not going to assume that a lot of people know about it because uh, just this past Wednesday sunset, the Jewish New Year started, and then it went from Wednesday to Thursday and finished up on Friday. So I think that's what, the 21st, 22nd, 23rd. And uh, that's the Jewish New Year. It's, it's called Rosh Hashanah. Um, Rosh means head, and Hashanah means year, the head of the year. So it's the start of the year. It's the Jewish New Year. For us, we believe that it's 2017. We'll go by our Gregorian calendar. Uh, uh, but in actual fact, for the Jewish people, they believe that the world started 5,000 778 years ago. And they'll go back to the time of Adam and Eve and Genesis like we've been reading about. And so uh, the interesting thing about the story of the Jewish New Year is the picture of the New Year that God gives in the numbers of 5778 or other numbers that were used in past years would always give the people of God an edge if they understood what those letters meant. The Jewish letters, the Jewish numbers, there are 22 letters of the alphabet. By the way, it's where our own alphabet and all the alphabets of the world come from. The first uh, letter of the Hebrew alf alphabet is Aleph. The second one is Bet. It's where we get alphabet. And so this is where language comes from, and the Jewish language is the first one. And so 22 letters of the Jewish alphabet. The Jews did something else, though, that's very interesting. Not only would they have a Hebrew alphabet with these 22 different letters, you would look at the letters, though, and if you looked at the letters, and this one you'll see... Uh, it looks like an N in the middle there, and it forms a gate. That's actually a eighth letter of the Jewish alphabet. We'll talk about that in a minute. And these letters of the alphabet would be numbered. So Aleph would be one. Bet would be two. And so on. And it would go right down the line to the the number 22. So you're, when you're looking at the Jewish alphabet, you're looking at the actual letters, then you're looking at and pronunciation, then you're looking at, and pronunciation even means something, the fifth letter of the Jewish alphabet is He. And it's a breath. And it speaks of the wind of God. And so you have the pronunciation, then you have the actual look. So you don't have to... Uh, be high-tech to get what I'm going to be talking about this morning. You'll be able to look at this eighth letter of the Jewish alphabet. And then the number, all of the numbers. Uh, if you are, are familiar with reading your Bible, you'll know that there are certain numbers that are very, very prominent. Others less prominent but very significant. Number seven is, is very significant. The number eight which is our, our number today, is very significant. So that's where we're going. I want to give you a Bible portion to look at, and I'm just going to open it up, explain it, so, so that it gives us a biblical launch pad and a background so that I can then just turn around and we'll look at the picture and we'll explain it. And this is what should happen between now and and into next year, 2018, when the, the next Jewish uh, year begins. And so we're, we're looking at the projection of our next year. I want you to turn to two places we're going to just briefly look at. Uh, one is Genesis chapter 3 and verse 24. Just this one verse. We, we've been doing a study in the book of Genesis over the last number of months, Pastor Leon, myself, the Genesis plan. And in Genesis chapter 3 and verse 24, it says this. So God drove out the man 
and he placed cherubim, that is an order of angels, at the east of the Garden of Eden, and a flashing sword which turned every way to guard the way to the tree of life. So we have verse 24 that speaks of the Garden of Eden. In our previous studies, we were talking about how there was Eden, there was a garden in Eden, and then there was the rest of the earth. And we talked of the significance of that, of how it related to what was called the tabernacle of Moses, the temple of Solomon, and to our own lives. So in Genesis chapter 3, verse 24, let me just share a couple of things here that will give us a good biblical foundation of how God works. Um, Maybe even I'll, I'll begin practically. If you wanted to go into an office building at the bank, any of the bank institutions, you would probably first be met by someone who is at reception. They receive you. And you can't get too far, especially, you know, there are vaults of money and all of that. And so you would go so far and... Uh, figuratively speaking, you'll hit a wall until someone receives you and gives you access to another door. And it might even be the uh, door of the person who does mortgages or investments. And you get to go in that door. And then it might be that that man or woman says, listen, I need to talk to the manager Come with me, let's go down to the manager's office. And you end up in the manager's office. How did you get into the manager's office? Because at first, you hit a wall. Then someone received you and took you through a door. And you were able to walk through and have access to a greater place of influence and opportunity. I'm going to be talking about this. And verse 24 gives us the biblical foundation for how God works in our lives, spiritually and practically. In verse 24, we are already at the place where Adam and Eve have sinned. And God says, listen, I love you. I'm going to find a remedy for your sin. This business of putting leaves on yourself is your own remedy. Uh, Chapter 3 and verse 21, he says, I'm going to have to kill an animal. Blood will will be shed and we'll put skins on you because uh, what you think was minor is actually quite serious for your life. And so blood has to be shed and I'm going to come into a relationship of love. I'm not out to get you, but we need to fix some things up here. And it's best for you to leave the garden. And that's where verse 24 is. God says, okay, I'm going to have you leave the garden. I'm sending you out of the garden. Because people have different Bible versions this morning, and I, I, it, this is illustrative for us, I'm not going to spend a lot of time here. But very simply, some versions make it sound like God placed Adam and Eve at the east of the Garden of Eden. Other versions make it sound like God placed the cherubim, this order of angels, at the east of the Garden of Eden. In actual fact, the word that's used here in my New King James Version is placed. This is a very, very poor rendering. Every other place in the Old Testament, the word dwelt is used. And what it's saying is that God's presence moved from the garden now to the very eastern edge of the Garden of Eden. So what Adam and Eve knew as the presence of the Lord in the garden, now not only are Adam and Eve kicked out of the garden, but God himself moves out of the garden. So it's God drove out the man and the woman, and God dwelt at the east of the Garden of Eden. You say, but there are cherubim there. That's right. God's presence would rest on the cherubim. So there's a presence of God that would rest on these guarding angels. You will see that all through the Old Testament 
in the tabernacle of Moses, the temple of Solomon, and on we could project it. This is God moving and being at the east of the Garden of Eden. Cherubim of, uh, are there. The presence of the Lord has moved there. Adam and Eve are kicked out. And it also says this, that there's a flaming sword. And whether you go into Latin, Hebrew, French, or English, a flaming sword is a flaming sword. It's hot and it's sharp. And it keeps people from just going in and out. I've been in some buildings where the person that they had at the front of the building, and I know this will be hard for you to believe this, but seemed to have more muscles than myself. <laughs> and I realized, okay, I can't just run through here. I'm going to have to be aware that unless I'm allowed, I can't get in. Now, we're coming to the point of this. In chapter 4, there are these two people, Cain and Abel, and they offer sacrifices. In actual fact, you know, there aren't chapter divisions in the Bible, so chapter 3 would go into chapter 4, and what you have in chapter 3 in verse 24 is God establishing a gate at the east of the Garden of Eden. His presence is there. Cherubim are there. They have a sword that's flaming and turning and turning and turning, and it means that Adam and Eve can't get in. But for Cain and Abel, their kids, and there were other people at that time, if they offered a proper sacrifice, they would be able to enter the garden and go out of the garden. In other words, they would be able to have access going in and going out. This is the spiritual, practical principle of life. I can't, no matter who I think I am, run into a bank screaming that I need to see the manager because I will end up in another place where keys are sounding in the door. You can't do it. Spiritually, this is the way God has designed things as well. And so at the east of this Garden of Eden, God says, my presence will be here, and I'll have angels there, and I will protect I will guard and I will watch over the coming in and the going out of people. And there are certain people who will not be allowed access. And there will be others who will be allowed to go in and they can come out. That's pretty much the way life is. You learn that there are levels of authority. There are places that you can go because your buds, your best friends, and all of that. And then you'll hit a wall, and you can't go past that until there's greater access that is given in some capacity. I'm simply saying that this is the precedent, and this is the protocol for moving in the things of God, of approaching gates and doors and realizing that every time you go through a gate or a door, it's because you have been given authorization to go through to another level of God's calling and destiny for your life. There are some things that stop. I, I was very interested. I was thinking this morning of Day of Hope and Leadership. Ten years. It's our final year. It's the stop of this, but it's the start of something more in a greater capacity. There's no giving up on our city or our region or anything like that. It's just that some things stop, and when there's faithfulness on a certain level, then a door opens to another level of, of capacity. God honors that. So we have this picture here in, in Genesis chapter 3 and verse 24. Then the next verse that I wanted to give you is in 1 Corinthians chapter 16 and verse 9. The Apostle Paul is someone who traveled the world and he said this, A great effective door has been opened up to me and there are many adversaries. You will find 
in your life at certain times when you're to move through from one place to another through the open door or the gate and you want to go through in an authorized way, you will discover that there are enemies, adversaries, who would try to hurt, obstruct, oppose the passage through. And so there's a way to pass through. You don't need to go through with a lot of dust and commotion. I remember when I lived down in um, Australia for about a year, and I was on a uh, farm, and uh, I was from the city. Uh, we got our, our milk from the milkman. And so on the farm, there were kangaroos and all sorts of different animals. And somebody said there was a big pig over there. And I tried riding him, and he came after me. And I thought he's going to chew me up. I, I cannot look at bacon the same anymore. And there was a goat. And I looked, and I thought, I'm going to milk this goat. I'm thirsty. It was a hot day. And so I asked for my friend to get the goat in a semi-headlock, you know, gently. You don't need to phone any animal cruelty people on me. But just gently, just gently. And I got underneath, and I thought, I'm going to have a drink. Well, number one is I hit everything but my mouth. Number two is this goat did not want this to happen. And my head's underneath on the ground. There's dust flying around and kicking around and my friends squirming around. And finally when I did, you know, get my first little sip, I thought this goat has been chewing on tin cans for about a half a year. So the whole thing was disappointing and a whole bluster. That's not how you pass through the gate. That's not it. I'm going to give you three basic points. And I want to say this. It's the letter, we would say in English, English, Chet. C-H-E-T. Now, Pastor Leon, bring the microphone, come up here. Because in English, we would say Chet, but that's not how you say it. It's got to have a little guttural in it but not too much. And I know that you can come through for me. Um, I want you to say, Chet. Chet. Yeah, a little softer. Chet. Oh, no, no, not your vo voice. Just, you? just less guttural. Uh, Chet? There it is. Say it again. Chet. I need a chicken bone to, uh, to say it properly. <laughs> One more time slowly. Chet. Say it with us. Het. Het. Just like that. Het. Dank je wel. Alsjeblieft. Krak het aan. So, het. That's the letter. Het. The fascinating thing, it's by its numerical value, it's the eighth letter of the alphabet. Well, eight is the number of new beginnings. You see, there's seven days is equal to a week, and on Monday you get to start again. And so all through the Bible, when you see the number eight, it's a new beginning. So this year is moving from something of the past, and we know we'll do that anyway. That's kind of obvious. But moving from something specific of the past into something new. There, there's a new opportunity. It's a new beginning of something. It's going to have a greater capacity, a greater influence. It will move us in a, in a uh, broader way. So it's new beginnings. Chet. Fascinating thing about this letter and let's just go to the, there it is, there we have it. Actually, my head's in the middle of it. There, that looks better. Is when you look at this letter, this is the Hebrew letter, and it looks like what? It looks like a door. I told you, you don't have to exercise yourself, uh, you know, in a great way today. You just look and you think, I, I could walk through that. It's a door. Well, Prior to it looking like this, it looked more like a fence or a wall. And so, chet means, that's pretty good though, eh? I think I'm, it's either Dutch or Hebrew right now. I think I'm moving in both. 
Um, and so het literally means a gate or a door, but it also means a wall or a separation or a fence. And you say, well, which does it mean? Well, the reason that I wanted to show you the middle screen here is that it's not a fence or a wall if you're walking with God and saying, Lord, I want to walk with you and I want to follow your authorization for my life. It becomes a wall when we find that we're just wandering on our own and I've heard people rail, they'll say, oh, this is po political, oh, it's favoritism, oh, and they, you know, everybody's against them. Listen, God has a plan for your life. You don't have to worry about the boogeyman at the door. A great door is opened up there. Many adversaries correct. But we're going to talk about how to go through the door of opportunity of this year. Why is it that Jewish people and Christians would have the edge of understanding 5778? Is they, they know what's going on. They know that to posture and position themselves for this year, it's important to be able to pass from the old into the new, to be able to get into a new beginning, to be able to be authorized to go through, because that was the issue. That was what we saw in Genesis chapter 3 and verse 24. And so, het literally means a wall or a door or a gate. What we're talking about this morning is being able to pass through the gate. There's that eighth letter of the Hebrew alphabet, chet, and it's right at the gateway there. So it's being able to pass through into something. Uh, you, you don't have to pull on things and get mystical and, and uh, cross-eyed over it. You'll discover that in this year and uh, possibly even today as you're listening to this, you'll think, you know what? I am moving from this into that. I, I, I have been prepared for that. I can see that. And so you realize, first point is this. The wall becomes a gate. For many people, they're always banging their heads against a wall. And when you don't follow the authorized way of entry, you'll find out that it's difficult, it's hard, and it won't produce the fruit. Just like probably if I'm unauthorized, to use my illustration again, and, you know, I run down to the bank and I go in there and I'm not honoring any of the authorities there, the next thing you'll hear out of my mouth is, Put me down. Put me down. And don't tase me. Don't tase me. Put me down. Why, why would I talk like that? Because they're going to carry someone like that out. I'm a danger to society because I'm unauthorized. But this is the year where God says you will have doors of opportunity opened up for you that sometimes it's, you, you can never earn it. But sometimes it's out of faithfulness. you just faithfully been serving, humbly serving. You're not trying to be the top person on the totem pole or uh, at the top of the, the, the ladder. You're simply wanting to be faithful with what God's given you. God says he'll turn your wall into a gate. That's what, that's what chet is about. That's what new beginning is about. When God involves and engages his presence in your life and you discover that, oh my goodness, I have an opportunity here. I'm able to do this. I've talked to many people. You know, a lot of us talk ourselves out of God's opportunities. And we say, oh, you know, the Lord can never use me or I'm not good enough and all that. I talk to a lot of people just like us. And they say, you know, I was doing this, and, you know, no one knew about me, and I was just being faithful, and I wanted to be a blessing, and I wanted to do better and make things better, and now I'm able to do this and do that and do that. That's a wall becoming a gate. Then, secondly, the gate 
is your access point. An access point usually is where you do well. It's your gifting. It's your calling. For some people, it's, you know, if they're best at sports or in the music field or in a certain kind of business. It's your gate. It's your door of opportunity. There are people that I could name in this church who have faithfully walked with God, and they found the door open, the door open, the door open, the door open. Who's doing that? Turning the... Other people say, oh, it's a wall. You'll never be able to do that. I don't listen to those people anymore. It might not happen for you, but because God's engaged, I'm looking for the gate or the door. And so the access point, the gate or the door, is just... As, as you're seeing there, it's, it's the brighter part. It's the transition. It's what seems natural. You're not over here and then suddenly a door opens over here and you think to yourself, that, that's a little hard on the camera people, sorry about that. Um, just the door opens over here and you think, I've never done this before but I'll give it a shot. No, 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 no. It's your transitioning into and through the access point. Now, let me just spend... So, number one, the wall becomes a door. Number two, the door is your access point, and that's what you're to walk through. Number three is this. Because a great door of opportunity is opened up, and there are many adversaries, it's important how you go through your door. It's one of the reasons when you know it's time of transition, you give yourself to sometimes extra prayer. You give yourself to worship before the Lord. So spiritually, you're just opening up and welcoming a greater presence of the Lord in your life. But thirdly, I want to emphasize this. Each time in the natural that you move into a greater realm, someone will have opened that door for you who was authorized. Someone who has a greater authority than you or me, and they have authority to open it. In the case of Adam and Eve, there were cherubim. These angels who were at the eastern part of the gate, Genesis 3 and 24. That's why we looked at it. And unless they gave the openness, the accessibility, it would be a flaming sword and you just couldn't get through. But this is when, I call it in, in my Schneiderian paraphrase language, I call it the kiss. Someone says, how'd you get that? Ah, oh, I knew so-and-so. And they said they wanted to help me. How'd you do that? Ah, oh, somebody phoned me and says, you know, they'd like to. And they were able to make the phone call and, you know. How'd, how'd you get there? Oh, I was in the church service. And the person said this and, you know, it was that God would open the door for me. And then I met this person. Can you believe it? And if they don't know the Lord and all that, I'll say, kind of, you know, fluky coincidence, huh? Yeah? How? Someone who has authority greater than you or me will open it. Sometimes it's angelic. It's invisible. I have, for years, taken credit for things that I realized later. That was God. I was just full of myself. I think I'm maybe full that much now. Didn't realize it. I, I, I thought, well, you know, I did that. I, you know, I, whew, my game's pretty good today. I threw a mean fastball. No, 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 no. This is about God opening doors. Now, we always want to do our best. We always want to optimize, maximize. Uh, use and develop and mature all the gifts and callings on our lives. But at the end of the day, I've seen people who have way more of all that stuff who didn't get anywhere and others who understood the principle of authorization and 
accessibility and understanding the time of being able to pass through. And when you realize, you know what, Pastor Doug? I wasn't going to step through this opportunity, but I'm hearing this morning that it might be God's behind it. There are some people in in my life over the years. I remember when I first gave my life to Jesus Christ. And uh, I had lived in Australia for a year. I wanted to serve the Lord, and I came back. When I was down in Australia, I could have done anything. No one would have known. And I had decided then, I lived at a a guy's rooming house, 16 other guys. I I, had determined, I'm going to serve the Lord. And uh, God sees me, and I'm going to live my life out for God. And I came home. My pastor said, uh, you know, I'd I'd like you to share your testimony and share your story a little bit. I'd never spoken before. And so I uh, I was, uh, pastor says, uh, you know, Sunday morning, and so I come and I I got my brogue shoes on and I wore my best pants and my hang tin shirt and I had some gospel tracks in my back pocket and uh, I was speaking and after it was over, a lady came up to me in the lobby of the church. She started to cry. And she said, this and this and this will happen. She says, in months you'll be going to Africa. And I thought, oh, please. And a couple of months later, I was invited to go to East Africa. I couldn't believe it. She became the person of authority for about five years to open doors for me. She was runner-up for Toastmasters worldwide. And her story is fascinating why she didn't win. Because uh, there was something that the Lord told her to do and she chickened out right at the end. And it cost her. But anyway, she became one of my authorities. Usually it's a person. It's somebody with skin. You stay close to somebody that you have relationship with because they'll open doors for you. That's part of who they are and are supposed to be in your life. And so that's why this word fits into alignment which we've been following for the last year, since last year, September. And you'll notice that we see here in the picture in our middle screen that there's a man there with a sword. In the spirit realm, we're talking about a spiritual force, a weaponry. We're not talking about physical force. We're not talking about getting under a goat and trying to get a drink and dust flying all over and all that. We're talking about someone who has authority to open the door so that you can go through to the next thing that God has for you. I am so certain of of this. Number one is, by the time you get to 57, 78, you should find out whether something works or doesn't work. And for myself, I've walked in this since 2003, so by my calculation, I'm 14 years in. I've seen every year how This is God's way. It gives you an insight that others might not have of this has ended. This has opened up. Who is my person of accessibility? I recognize that God is supreme authority overall, but there is a delegated authority that I want to be in alignment with. And as I walk through, I'll embrace the new things that God has for me. Would you stand, please? It's interesting, in fact, more than interesting, in Genesis chapter 3 and verse 24, for the first time, the phrase or the two words, the way, are mentioned. It's this eastern access of God's presence sitting on cherubim. To guard the way to the tree of life. In John chapter 14 and verse 6, it hasn't changed. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes unto the Father except through me. You can't come another way. In one sense, Christianity is extremely bigoted. It's not saying that all roads lead to God the Father. Jesus says, I am the way. This is the access point. It's open. It's totally open. It's for anyone who will walk through. Jesus stands at 
at the door, at the gate, and says, come in, come in. If, if you'll turn from your sin, if you're willing to turn from it, then I'll allow you to come to the Father and we'll wash all of your sins away and you'll be able to find new strength from me and when I come back, you'll be able to go to heaven. I've talked to people, and this is the way it will work in the last day, you know, judgment day. I've talked to people, they say, I had a dream, and I was at the pearly gates, and I saw St. Peter, and St. Peter said to me, you can't come in. And I said, St. Peter, and they go on like this all the time. The only part that's true about their story is there's a gate. And I hate it when a good story comes to me right at the end. A great story. But the only one who will ever let you or me in is Jesus. He washed all of our sins away. He took away our little fig leaves and blood was shed through Jesus Christ. And God says, and this is, this is the word that's used for covenant. There's a chuppah. There's a covenant relationship. A wedding ceremony, if you will, where you can find forgiveness of sin and Jesus will come into your life. With every head bowed, I want to do two things. Then we're going to release for our meet the pastors. And don't forget about tonight for the sun seekers as well. It'll be a, just a full great day. But two things. Number one, Christians pray. There are people possibly here this morning. You say, I don't know Jesus. I thought just going to church was my gateway. It's not. Jesus is the way. You say, I, I want Jesus to come in my life. I want forgiveness of sin. If that's you this morning, just put your hand up high because I'm going to pray for people before we have a last prayer. Just hold it up high, up in the balcony or the main auditorium. You say, I need the Lord. I want to be included in this prayer. Just for a moment as I wait. Over in my right side, I see a hand way over there. You can put it down. How many others? You say, yes. Up in the balcony, I'm watching as well. Main floor, I'm watching as well. I'm going to wait just for a moment longer because we're going to finish it up here. Anyone else? You say, I need the Lord. I'm going to wait just for a moment. Just for a moment. God's talking to you. You're not ready to meet the Lord. Anyone else? Here's what I want us to do. Person way on the right side, I'm going to ask you after the service is over to come up after we've prayed, and they'll give you a complimentary packet. They'll still be here at the front to pray for people, but congregation, out of courtesy for this person. Let's pray together. And you who raised your hand, and maybe there could be others, you just didn't get the courage to put it up. Pray this prayer with us. Lord Jesus, I've sinned against you. I've broken your laws. I feel like I've been kicked out of the garden. But I thank you. You've come after me. You love me. You want to solve my problem. You want to wash my past sins away. This morning, I'm willing to stop sinning by the grace of God. And I turn to you, Jesus, to come into my body right now and wash all of my past sins away. I thank you that you love me you receive me, and you make me part of the family of God right now, a full-fledged member of your family. I love you, Jesus. Amen. Would you welcome her into the family of God? Just lift your hands before we close. Holy Spirit, at this moment, as we stand at this new year, not mystical, not just being sensational, not being religious, but realizing that you have a plan for the ages. In this 5778, or September 2017 to many of us, 
we say, Lord, continue to leave the gate open for embassy. Continue to leave the gate open for our lives, our families, our children, our spouses, in business, for our city, for our region. We open the gates. We say, Lord, keep the gates open and with your authority, allow us to pass through to the other side, the better side, the more of you. And we say, let it be released. Let it be released in Jesus' name. New beginnings, greater capacity, greater responsibility, greater wisdom to walk in this. And we'll give you praise and honor and glory. We'll remember this is from you. Amen. Amen.